Okay, so this is the second video of global climate from the IB Geography syllabus. This point is about changes in the global energy balance and the role of feedback loops. So the subtopics that we'll discuss are solar radiation variations, including global dimming due to volcanic eruptions, terrestrial albedo changes and feedback loops, and methane gas release and feedback loops. Okay, so first of all, let's go through solar radiation variations. Okay, so what are solar radiation variations? Well, there are three kind of main subsections here. So there's variations in the Earth's orbit, also known as the Milankovitch cycles, which we'll go through in a lot of detail soon. Then there's sunspots and solar cycles, and then there's global dimming. So we're going to look at these um, kind of phenomenon, phenomena, and how they impact, um, or how they may impact the global energy balance. Okay, so first of all, variations in the Earth's orbits, the Milankovitch cycles. So from this diagram, you can see what the Milankovitch cycle is. So it sounds kind of complex, but it's basically just these three um, different types of movements and how they might impact the Earth's energy balance. So we're gonna, I'll give you a little bit of an overview now and then we'll kind of see the real definitions okay so eccentricity is when the kind of shape of the earth's orbit around the sun changes so here it's a more circular here and it's more elliptical so the earth encounters more variation in the energy that it receives from the sun when the earth's orbit is elongated than it does when the earth's orbit is more circular because if it was more kind of elongated the earth and the sun are kind of closer together um at certain points okay and then we have tilt it's also known as axial tilt so the tilt of the earth's axis varies between 22.2 degrees and 24.5 degrees so the greater that the tilt angle is the more solar energy that the poles will receive so there'll be more energy um, at the poles uh, as in like the north and south poles okay and then finally we have precession which is basically a gradual change or wobble in the orientation of the earth's axes and this affects the relationship between the earth's tilt and eccentricity so this kind of relates to both of these other factors and they all kind of all interrelate and create their own types of impacts um which is kind of why it's a uh, one put all into one cycle because they're all kind of interrelated um, but this can change the energy balance because the axis of the Earth is kind of like wobbling. Um, yeah. Okay, so each one here. So we kind of have covered this already, but eccentricity are changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun due to gravitational fields of neighboring planets. And the strongest kind of gravitational fields um, impacts on the Earth are Saturn and Jupiter's. And as eccentricity de decreases, the season's lengths tend to balance out more. And if not, then the season's lengths get kind of more extreme and I guess more um, uneven. Okay, axial tilt changes in the inclination of the axis of the Earth in relation to the plane of its orbit around the Sun. So if you have a greater axial tilt, the hemisphere is closer to the Sun. So during summer, there will be a larger amount of heat than where the tilt is less. Um, and then regions in the extreme upper and lower hemispheres will experience the hottest summers and the coolest winters during a maximum tilt. And this leads to extreme weather patterns. Finally, precession, as we saw, is when the Earth wobbles on its axis and results in greater seasonal contrast. So the axis wobbles in cycles of more than less than 26,000 years caused by tidal forces from the sun and the moon. And it is kind of known as the reasoning behind very long nights and very long days at certain times of the year, um, for example, in Norway. And it also makes seasonal contrast more extreme in one hemisphere and less in another. So these are kind of different um, parts of the Milankovitch cycles and you kind of see how they can impact the energy balance of the sun to the earth. Okay, next we'll discuss sunspots and solar cycles. So sunspots are dark spot, spots on the surface of the sun, as you can see in this picture from NASA. These very dark spots, and they're very hot. Um, I mean, obviously the whole sun is hot, but like these are very, very hot. Okay, so the number of sunspots reaches a maximum around every 11.1 years during the solar cycle. 
Okay, so the energy from the sunspots travels to the Earth's surface through shortwave radiation. As we saw in the previous video, shortwave radiation is emitted from hot bodies, so from the sun. The measure of the sunlight that falls upon one square meter of the Earth's surface is insulation, which we also defined in the last video. Hence, where there are higher numbers of sunspots, there will be higher insulation. The sunspots result in intense magnetic energy on the Earth's surface and events such as solar flares and hot gas injections. When sunspots are less intense, there tends to be an association with decreases in the Earth's temperature. So, of course, this impacts the energy balance of the Earth. Okay, so now finally, as part of the idea of variations in the Earth's orbit, or I mean, in solar radiation variations, um, the final part of that was global dimming. So global dimming is a decrease in the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth due to particulate matter in the atmosphere absorbing and reflecting it back into space. So basically, when there are all these small particles in the atmosphere for whatever reason, typically volcano, volcanic eruptions, which we'll move on to later. This results in increased presence of aerosol particles in the atmosphere caused by human action. And the smaller droplets make clouds more reflective so that more incoming sunlight is reflected back into space and less reaches the Earth's surface. So that actually does um, possibly create a cooling effect. However, from this quote in the Huffington Post, it says, Global dimming therefore creates a cooling effect that may have partially counteracted the effect of greenhouse gases on global warming. It is worth noting that there has been a reversal in this trend in some parts of the world. So it can have kind of dual effects. And in the terms of a volcanic eruption, gases such as sulfur dioxide from eruptions mixed with water vapor. This creates tiny sulfate particles in the atmosphere which reflect some sunlight creating a cooling effect but also absorb some sunlight so that creates a warming effect um, kind of in terms of the greenhouse effect and if there are more particles than normal which is usually the case in a volcanic eruption there's more particles for water to bind to so that means that there's more particles to reflect um, heat back into space so again it's maybe possible that there is more cooling than warming but the as seen in this quote from before there has there's kind of different trends in different parts of the world okay so that's all for variations in the earth's orbit in relation to the global energy balance now we're going to look at changes in terrestrial albedo so if you kind of look globally to get an idea of albedo and ter terrestrial albedo globally the highest albedo rates are in areas such as northern africa and australia with high levels of sand cover and that promotes the albedo effect because it reflects um, incoming uh, radiation much better than a dark surface would and then also areas such as antarctica have a high albedo rates due to the ice which is very bright and snow cover which is very bright um, so they have um, very reflective properties, so they create cooling impacts on the Earth's surface. Okay, so this does link to feedback loops, which we will be discussing later on in the video. But now we're going to move on to discussing changes in methane gas release. Okay, so methane is a greenhouse gas. It's much more potent than greenhouse gases. It, it's a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, although it is in a lower concentration in the atmosphere, it's very strong and it has very um, kind of strong impacts in terms of the greenhouse effect. So here are some sources of methane, um, kind of just to give you an idea of where methane can der be derived from. So water conditions like wetlands and rice fields, biomass burning, landfill and waste disposal sites because of the decomposition of organic matter. It's a byproduct of digestive processes of herbivores such as cow, sheep, and termites. And even in humans, um, it's minor in humans, but it's still a product of our digestive processes, fossil fuel production, um, oceans through microbial activity, and mud volcanoes on the seafloor. But one of the most important sources which we will be discussing in terms of feedback loops is from when permafrost warms and thaws, it releases methane into the atmosphere. Okay, so thinking about terrestrial albedo and methane gas release, let's think about feedback loops. So when methane is released, it leads to higher temperatures 
because of the greenhouse effect of course and because of that the kind of increased um, temperatures that will melt permafrost even more and permafrost is a known as a thick subsurface layer of soil that remains below freezing point throughout the year, occurring chiefly in polar regions. So the permafrost melts because of the higher temperatures because of methane, and then the permafrost releases even more methane because it's melting, and then that methane will warm the um, earth again, melting even more permafrost, then even more methane is released, and it kind of feeds into this positive feedback loop. So a positive feedback loop is when an issue exacerbates and feeds into itself so it's basically just making the issue bigger and bigger so if you want to think of what's a negative feedback loop so an example would be when the rate of photosynthesis in plants increases due to higher temperatures um, leading to more carbon dioxide being removed from the atmosphere by plants that reduces the greenhouse effect so it cools the earth and reduces global temperatures so it's this idea of counteracting um, the initial thing so here we first have more photosynthesis because of more because of higher temperatures and then this is counteracted by a increase in photosynthesis so more carbon dioxide being taken in and that takes away from the greenhouse gases meaning it is cooling the earth so it's like an opposite effect instead of a positive feedback loop which kind of feeds into itself so this also does link with terrestrial albedo because when snow melts, um, as we see here, permafrost snow, as it melts, permafrost is released, the terrestrial albedo effect is lessened because there's less kind of surfaces to reflect sunlight, so it warms the earth even more and it kind of just, as mentioned before, it feeds into itself.